Hi, I'm Sean Charles Baker, and I'm here to tell you about my new book, Murder Virus, which is up for pre-order at barnesandnoble.com and Amazon, anywhere that you order books. There's a pandemic of violence flooding the streets of major cities all around the world. And as cases of the media dubbed murder virus, MV20, soar, everyone infected goes on a nonstop killing spree. Caught in the middle of all this in downtown Seattle is police detective Angela Miller, and her only trustworthy ally is the self-proclaimed psychic detective Gerald Henry. So as these two try to navigate the violence, they are drawn into New Age guru Abram Lynn Harvest's plot to heal the planet. Harvest's missive? The world is sick and humanity is the infection. The cure? You guessed it. Murder. Up for pre-order, barnesandnoble.com, Amazon, anywhere that gets books can get it for you. Hello, I'm Sean Charles Baker. Welcome to another episode of A Most Horrible Library. So it was an absolute honor for us to have comics legend Kelly Jones on the show this week to discuss another comics legend, the inimitable Bernie Wrightson, who passed away almost four years ago to the day that we did this episode. Our discussion with Kelly is extensive, so we had to cut it into two episodes, the first of which you are currently listening to, the second one, which will drop this Wednesday, March 24th. Enjoy the first part, and we'll see you back here on Wednesday. Yeah, I guess how we usually kind of start these is, um, you know, just uh, if you could tell us a little bit about, you know, your personal history with the horror medium. Okay. Um, not, nece not necessarily just with comics, but just, you know. No, no, I, I look, I, yeah, I agree. Cause it's an all, it's an all encompassing love. So mm -hmm. yes. <laughs> I know uh, that you're a, you're a cinema fan. And I was, so <laughs> earlier today I was rereading the original hammer series of which i i bought it. i kind of stumbled upon it in mm -hmm. 1997 when dark horse dark horse started publishing it and I mean, you know i've reread it several times that and the subsequent series right um, i actually i didn't know it was collected in the hardcover so i just ordered that earlier today so i'm oh, super psyched you. about that uh you're welcome but well, thank you for making it because i <laughs> i love it but in one of the letter columns you reference Two, you know, you say inevitably when I do an interview, people ask me about my influences and I want to talk about two of them. You say H.P. Lovecraft and yeah. you say Charles Pierce, who did The Legend of uh, Boogie Absolutely. Creek. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's funny because now I haven't seen it in a couple of years and I only saw it one time and it was in the midst of the original Shudder Joe Bob Briggs marathon. So I'm not entirely sure how cognizant I was, mm -hmm. but, you know, it, it made an impression on me because yep. it, it seems like, and, and Joe Bob is obviously great. He talks so much about it and gives you all this background, but I still have the recording from, I videotaped him doing it because I wanted his take on it. And uh, for him to place it number two in all time, great drive-in movies was an, was an honor. Wow. Yeah. That, that blew me away. And, and it's kind of a little bit of like, when I first saw it, I'm like, this is kind of Blair Witch, like way before Blair Witch. Oh, it, it's, it falls into, and I don't mean this the way it's going to sound, it falls into the Kubrickian type of thing. 2001 can't be classified as a drama. It's not a documentary. Right. It's not a linear narrative. It's, no, it's, it's utterly unique. And that's what The Legend of Boggy Creek was, was it's not a documentary, but it's not a movie either, but it's, not, it's, a, it's this weird thing. And, and it's a hybrid of all of them, but it's utterly unique. And what it does so well, unintentionally or intentionally, I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm not there. I don't know. But for me, it had to have been because it's what they edited and put onto right. film. And I think if you see Charles Pierce's other films, uh, The Evictors and The Town That Dreaded Sundown, they're absolutely terrifying and unique and original. Before everybody else, he does a serial killer film, right. you know, based on a true thing. Uh and the evictors is just pure atmosphere based on a legend. 
Okay. So, so when he did The Legend of Boggy Creek, there's these moments that don't rely on anything other than you and me wa- when you're watching it. He'll show a tree line and he'll just have you hear the animal sounds and he changes the natural ambient sound that we would all enjoy to, there's something out there looking at you, you can't see it, and then it becomes creepy. It's pure atmosphere. It's it's the best kind of horror because it stays with you forever. And if you go out in the world and see a tree line and hear those things, you start thinking it. Right. Um, The fact that he's telling you this is a true story, um, not based on, not influence it's a true story and then he tells the story but then he'll weave in the real people that this happened to right and then he'll weave out um maybe because it's exploitation and they had to get it out and they were trying to make uh uh uh, make a buck basically they didn't spend a lot of time on all the overthinking of something um i think what they do to the audience is when they weave out and then all of a sudden they say, here's the real guy, here's the incident that happened. It makes you go, okay, this is silly to, well, um, well, wait a minute, there's the guy saying it. Um, I think the soundtrack uh, is wonderful. It There's this real locale to it, a real place to it, a real atmosphere mm-hmm. to it. No different than if they went to Romania and said, we're gonna talk about vampires. Right, yeah, and, definitely. Uh, and the fact that this is, here in our country, we never tend to think of our country as being that way. Um, and the fact that that there's a sincerity to it. Uh, never once does it say we're lying to you or right. this is silly. It's very sincerely made with a respect to the people who live there. They're not hicks and hillbillies. They're people like you and I, and they live mm-hmm. there. And this thing happens to be there. Wonderful. And even as a kid, which I didn't it's only later on that, I, that sincerity comes through, whether you're a kid like I was when I first saw it. And then when I was an adult and it still worked its magic, you know, um, I'm very glad that they just recently put it out on a Blu-ray. They were able to find the original negatives, um, the families involved in doing it. And I think they're wise too, because uh, once people sit down with it and, and just see it and it, take it in, it works a power that very few directors get, very few filmmakers get, very few uh, uh, people who try to create horror can get this atmosphere. Um, I've always tried to replicate it and it's influenced me, like I said, to this day. Um, I go back every once in a while and watch it and I try to remove everything and just say, I'm gonna watch it like anyone else. Mm -hmm. I wait till it's night, not because it has to be night, just for less distraction. I can watch it in the day, it, it, same, it doesn't matter. But it starts to work its power at the very beginning where they just let you hear the sounds of the swamp. And then you hear this, this lonely howl way off somewhere. And you go, is that an animal? Is that a, what is that? Right. And then but and then they just start playing this thing like it's all nice and happy, but then the sun goes down and there's something there. And these people who live in this environment, who know these woods, who knows this swamp, who know this this environment, don't know what it is. That's brilliant. And right from there, you're you're hooked. Well, and it makes you feel like like what you're describing with the howl and you don't know if it's an animal or yeah. that's exactly how you would feel if you were in the woods and you heard that, right? I Every, grew up, like I've I, had that. Yeah, I grew up partially in woods and never thought Same. of this. And after I saw this and and it it did change my view of things. I used to go off. I never worried about bears or lions or anything like that. Mm-hmm. real things, real things. I mean, I don't know if this is real or not. I tend to think there's something to it, but okay. Uh, it's an extraordinary thing. It needs extraordinary proof, I guess. So, but I know that where I was, the real bears and lions were dangerous, but I never thought twice about them. Right. You know, I heard them cry and howl and do their thing, but I knew they were probably more afraid of me than I was of them. So I, I just exactly. go off on my own, which was right. stupid. <laughs> um, and then I saw this movie and it utterly changed me to this day. I really get the hairs up on my arm when I see a tree line. 
where you can't see into it. That's awesome. Um, there's just something about it. And, and, you know, maybe the fact was after I saw this film and I had to walk home through these old uh, abandoned olive orchards. And if you've seen an olive tree and they're not taken care of, they are evil looking trees. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All gnarled and twisted. <laughs> and I had to walk a good distance through that as the sun was going down, hustling my step. Because though I lived in a in a town, uh, rural, but a town, you know, he was there now. He wasn't there when I right. went there. <laughs> he was there yeah. after I left. <laughs> right. Um, and God bless Charles Pierce for doing that, you know? Yeah, um, that's a special thing. It's hard. I mean, movies generally don't do that. Movies generally are either, you know, uh, grotesque or jump scares but it's very well, there's cheat. very few movies that are that scary that they, they affect cheat. charles anybody. pierce didn't cheat he didn't have the money to cheat so he had mm -hmm. to tell a good ghost story right right and i think there's two guys that i always kind of liken to that that can be made that you know they're ridiculed or they're put down or whatever but they are remember one is charles pierce who i think is wonderful and the other was dan curtis who did primarily television stuff right so he, he created Dark Shadows, which I, I like, but I love mm -hmm. when he did his television horror. And I think he's an incredibly unsung horror director. Um, as with Pierce, he he has this um, quality of making an image, something that you see married with whatever that you never forget. Right. He was just having to make a deadline too. He didn't have huge amounts of money. I think his version of Dracula with Jack Palance is incredible. Uh, I think his regular stuff, uh, obviously people go to Trilogy of Terror, but like Pierce, he he was able to take, he could take the silliest things. Uh, his his uh, sequel to The Night Stalker, The Coal Shack, which was The Night Strangler, was more frightening to me than The Night Stalker, and I loved it. Mm -hmm. um, he did a one called the Norless Tapes, uh, the same thing, which absolutely terrifying. Um, how it got on TV then, <laughs> I don't know. But I remember being riveted by these things. And they stood out to me where I would, to this day, remember them as having incredible moments. Both of these directors had patience. So they took their time getting to something. And they piled up the atmosphere and the tension and the suspense and had the ability to pay off when they gave you something boy you never forgot it uh, now it's there's a lot of laziness and stuff it's hard to find really good stuff now you can find something that makes you jump but yeah that's that's my kid slamming a door or you know something yeah. like that mm -hmm. but to get under your skin like that is a neat trick the british have a good skill of that their television people um are remarkably good at doing that uh but that's probably because the bbc has no money um so it relies on the talent they have which i prefer no money i prefer low rent um i think then you that separates the talented from the untalented well yeah then you have to rely Definitely. on ingenuity like you said you can't cheat you can't just throw a bunch of money at something and and you know try to uh make it that way you have to yeah. actually kind of get into the dirt yeah i i think uh uh and not uh going down a rabbit hole too much but that's what i like about british horror from the late 60s uh during the 70s television horror um there's things like the stone tape uh no, i don't by know nigel neal um it, check these things out they're they're stunning uh the, the the original Woman in Black, which mm -hmm. was a television adaptation, again, written by Nigel Neal, directed by Herbert Wise, is probably the most frightening thing I have ever seen. Wow. Um, I, I can say that easily. It is the most frightening thing I've ever seen. And it was released on Christmas Eve. <laughs> wow. It, it, um, nice. <laughs> it's their tradition in England to tell or watch a ghost story on Christmas Eve, it goes way back. I think uh, the most famous being Christmas Carol. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but if you see these things, the MR James adaptions they did for Christmas, they're brilliant. Abs 
absolutely brilliant and terrifying. Um, and they're again, the same, they're a television program. They release these things on Christmas Eve because that's what you did. It's a cold night. Mm -hmm. You, you, uh, it's it, everyone huddles around and they would tell these stories. So, and, and it used to be MR James who would write these things f with that intent at Christmas, he would read these um, to his friends. He never meant them to be published. So when they made them uh, whistle and I'll come for you, my lad in 1968 is as good a thing as I've ever seen. Um, and they're purely atmospheric. So they all fall in this Charles Pierce thing. They all fall into that same how I'm affected by it. Um, and certainly don't get me wrong. I can, I, there's modern stuff I love as well. It's just, and it's not nostalgia. I, I showed, speaking of this, uh, one of those little stories, uh, Bernie Wrightson had told me we were at a show once and we're sitting next to each other. And he said he was very sad that there was really nothing horror film wise that would scare him anymore. Maybe he'd outgrown it too much nuts and bolts and the whole thing. And I said, uh, I know something that will scare the hell out of you. I said, I, it, it never fails to get me. I said, every few years I pull it out, I watch it and it works on me. And I, and it was the woman in black, uh, the television one. Well, it's hard to find and you can't. Okay. But I had, a, I had bought a couple extra copies. One I'd sent to Steve Niles, the writer uh, who had said something similar. And uh, all I told him was, I said, turn off all your phones, get rid of all that stuff, wait till it's nighttime because you don't want the distraction and put it on and let this thing work its magic on you. And it's a television show. Um, writes and said, well, uh, you're probably talking it up too much. I said, I'm not talking it up enough. And I guarantee <laughs> you when it happens, when this thing works its thing, I win. You're going to say I win. <laughs> And uh, I sent it to him. A couple weeks later, all I got back from him was, you son of a bitch, just scared the hell out of me. <laughs> oh, wow. How great this was. He was so grateful that this scared him. Uh, Niles told me the same thing. And it was like, dear God, this thing is horrifying. Now, they remade it and whatever, and they fell into the trap of the special effects. And the, mm -hmm. they don't trust the audience to be sharp enough to follow along. Um, but this program and specifically the adaptation by Nigel Neal is along with the stone tape, I think uh, very, very few can ever reach that. I think Kubrick shining trusted its audience to be intelligent. It's that kind of thing. We trust mm -hmm. you to be intelligent. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but we're going to tell you a story now. So turn off the lights. We're going to talk to you for a bit and you will not sleep tonight. And these things do that. Um, I think the stone tape, which is the finest, closest approximation to Lovecraft ever. Nothing comes close. Wow. To what that is. Um, wow. It's, it's, unbelievably original to this day it's not a pastiche and it is terrifying you just wait you just it's terrifying and all of these things are so whenever i need to refresh myself i pull all these things out and um if i have someone who's skeptical they can't be, fr I play these things. If I have someone who says, I don't enjoy this genre, I play these things. And uh, I, okay, for example, with The Woman in Black, a uh, friend of mine has just daughters and they've seen everything, nothing scares them. They were all tough and whatever. And I said, okay, fine. And I had them come over and they all were talking about whatever they like now. And it's all the perfectly fine modern stuff. And I just put this thing in and they're all talking and they're all saying this stuff and they get quieter and quieter and quieter until they have screamed like I've never heard people scream. <laughs> and oh, I just great. sat there and I knew it was coming and it still affects me. I know right. these scenes are coming. Right. I know this atmosphere. It just works. And uh, 
again, that's that's the power of a good story well told. And you don't need a lot of money. You, you uh, the actors can uh, do all this without anything. Um, do I like all the other extra stuff? Absolutely. Um, but I tend to always come back to this and that I try to replicate or try to, at least in, in, in sequences, try to replicate. You, you definitely, you know, I, I can remember exactly the first comic of yours that I saw where it made me a fan and it affected me. And it's, um, Sandman 17, um, Calliope. Yeah. And it's just the first page when you see that Bezor, I think that's how you pronounce it. Yeah. Yeah. That is one of the creepiest. I mean, you've drawn some creepy, creepy things. There's stuff in the, in the hammer series that, with the stuff, things that you do with like flesh that is not it, like just pure nightmare fuel. And I, I don't, you know, there's a lot of horror and horror comics that I like, but this is just, it, I've always thought it was something else. And it's definitely, uh, you know, I believe you won an Eisner for Seasons of Mist. And mm -hmm. it's it's well deserved because just the hellscape, mm -hmm. even just the, you know, the opening where you see the outside of the city with all the, yeah. the way that you use flesh to make structures or just an atmosphere like we're talking about is insane to me. And it reminds me that, you know, so Bernie Wrightson does it with, I, I having just reread Mary Shelley's Frankenstein with his illustrations. Yeah. First time I've read it with his illustrations. Yes. You can walk into some of those, like the time he spent just on the blades of grass. I think what it is, it, and and I, uh, I've said this before, but but. I wrote it down once, but I believe this. Um, I believe there was a sadness in Wrightson when he finally had to show these things, when really? he finally had to present them. And the reason I say that is this was a personal project of love. I only mentioned to this to him once. He did this for himself. There was no publisher. Nobody was paying him. He would have to go off and do something to make some money and then come back to work on these. And it would take him roughly a, a week or two, you know, depending. Um, but I think the reason I say that is while he was doing this, he was the only one seeing it. So he was in that world that he loved so much. This story that he loved so much. And while he was in that world, it was, there was no criticism. There was no, you should do this. There was no praise. There's nothing. It's just him alone with this, this feeling, uh, this love, this purity. As soon as you release it, it's not his anymore. We, it's not. I mean, I know that from my own experience. It becomes other people's too. As much, if not more so, they'll know it better than you do. Uh, mm -hmm. And I told him that I said, I bet, yes, obviously you're, you know, you want to share this thing or whatever, but there's that part of you that didn't. And I said, I bet you there was kind of a sadness when um, you knew everybody was going to see it. And he had said he, he had not verbalized that before, but he had felt that. Yes. He said, wow. yeah, there is because it was, he was, you can't, it's almost like a Mandela, how he, you, the degree of intensity of these things. I would also say, if you look at them, a lot of artists, great ones, will lose the lighting. They'll lose whatever the primary lighting is on a, compli a piece that complicated. Mm -hmm. um, they'll lose it. You'll see some object that's not properly lit or the light's coming from a different angle or the textures change. Never in any of these pieces does that happen. Yeah. Every single one maintains this. Uh, you wouldn't think that's necessary, but when you go through a Wrightson piece, it's why we remember it. Yeah, that's it, it's, well it's, said. It's, it's just one of those things. He never, he could do a whole piece just to get, just to do these little lit, places everyone thinks shadows and that's true but there's several of his pieces frankenstein 
clearly there's a number of them in there. Uh, but a lot of his poster work, a lot of his great work, all of this work to arrive at this moment where there's just these little bits of light touching something, which makes it all come to life. And I, and I think of the enormous amount of work you take to get to that goal. Um, stunning that he does that, but it makes it all come to life. Yeah. And, and I think, I think with Bernie, I, I, I've always marveled at his ability to grab a reader and bring them along and not show you gore and blood and guts. And he's not to me, he's, he's like, uh, people would say that. And I go, God, I, I can't really remember him doing that too much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, what, it, and that's not because he, he was high minded or prudish or whatever. He went to that next level of horror. And it's what I was saying. He knew how to be quiet. Definitely. And he knew how to make you in that quiet build all this atmosphere and tension and then get to the moment. I think cool air is one of the genius pieces I've ever seen because nothing happens in it until the last page. It's all guys sitting around reading two guys talking in an apartment. It's beautifully drawn, but frankly boring. If you don't know, if you don't let yourself be taken in by this, uh, and then he ups the ante of what potentially could be a failure of an adaptation by making that last page a full page spread. So it isn't, he doesn't hide behind anything. It's, it's tour de force. And the fact he was so young that he did this, you know, I always used to tell him that I would say, um, the fact that you were in your mid twenties, and you could handle that level of skill um, as an artist and as, uh, uh, as, as someone adapting a story like that. Uh, Lovecraft's incredibly difficult mm -hmm. to adapt. He didn't take the easy ones where there's tentacles and monsters and all that crap. He did, a, he did this where the guy just literally dissolves. He's a corpse and man to this day you get to that last page it works just works and if you notice he goes from all these smaller panels to larger and larger panels and then the last one's a big one it, um it's brilliant on every level and the fact that he could do that at such a youthful age um he was a very humble man he was a very very sweet person and i think that he had every right to be the opposite when you have that much genius uh, but he didn't i think i think he knew uh, look he's one of the few guys he's the only guy i can think of they invented a whole new genre just to hire him at dc they invented the monster as a lead book he didn't want to do superheroes he could have <laughs> right. easily done Batman. He could have easily mm -hmm. done. There's a number actually of characters at DC he could have done. He didn't want to do any of them. And DC got together and to hold on to him, Swamp Thing. Um, okay. I believe he he turned something down while he, I, I don't remember what it was. He turned a bigger title down while he was working on Swamp Thing mm -hmm. because he couldn't he knew he couldn't handle both and he wanted to stay with Swamp Thing. And that was in its early, you know, the first year, I believe, of its of its run. Well, he falls into the Steranko zone of a handful of books made his reputation. And, you know, you're looking at, yes, he did some the the horror short horror stories and covers and whatnot. When he did Swamp Thing, you're talking 10 issues over the course of about two years. Um turned everything upside down uh, and became the definitive. And I would say, yes, it, it, and rightfully so, people will put everyone in boxes, but uh, he was more than a horror artist because it, what he did, there's a lot of guys who could do, um, certainly could do horror well. I think a great artist who could do horror well, but, Wrightson was inventing tropes and inventing new things. 
uh, his doing the werewolf and swamp thing changed mm-hmm. werewolves. It wasn't a cinema interpretation that did. It was Wrightson who did mm-hmm. in a comic. Um, his, his view of Frankenstein, the first time you see him, he married the Karloff with what he wanted to do, this emaciated, thin, mm-hmm. which, which Len Wein said they fought about constantly, but Wrightson won out. And you never forget these things. Mm-hmm. Um, the The fact that he could do this at an almost effortless level, uh, I think really speaks volumes. I, I think as much praise as we give rights and rightfully so, he didn't go out and say it himself. And at one point he told me, he says he didn't like how he sounded, um, how his interviews came off. He says, I, I came off uh, um, almost like I sounded arrogant or something like that. Now I'd read these interviews and I said, I, I didn't pick that up, but he did. He didn't like how he sounded. And I said, and I didn't even say, well, you sound confident. I just didn't pick it up. And he says, well, I didn't like how he sounded. I was a different guy then. And I didn't like how he sounded. And I just decided to not do that anymore. And um, I still don't pick it up when I read it. I hear what he's, you know, but he would say, I said, Bernie, you'd say these things that were so right on that applied to more than art. And one of them was that a drawing is, that a piece of art, a drawing, a page or whatever, um, is only great, can only be great if that last three or four percent, five percent of effort you follow through on. You can draw great 95 percent and if you lose your enthusiasm or your steam, it brings it all down. Wow. And that's true of anything in life, you know? Obviously, if a brain surgeon, I want him to be 100 percent great all the way <laughs> um, so, so he's right about that, but that has stuck with me and it's kind of like Stanley Kubrick's great line of you either care or you don't. I put that right together with Wrightson's. It's uh, the last few percent on a on a on a piece. That's what's going to make it or not. That's that's where that's the surface, and people are going to look at that. And then, and so if you blow it, um, you blow it. I think um, as well, Wrightson can't really be duplicated in so many ways because he could handle so much of this. You didn't see the technicalities with him. Uh, He could handle color, he could handle black and white, he could handle um, so so many different aspects of art, of art, uh, that when he brought it to comics, you knew that there was not just a great technical guy, there's tons of great technical guys. Very few that are great technical guys who hide that technical and bring you ideas, bring you that, that powerful vision. Um, I, it's hard to describe him because when he did comics, he was a great comics artist. When he did illustrations, he was a great illustrator. He would borrow from both, but he knew to separate both. When you look at Frankenstein or his incredible poster series, any of his single images, he doesn't do a good drawing. He tells a story in a good drawing. So when you look at uh, Hunter, the great vampire piece, you don't see, even see the vampire. You don't see anything. It's a guy walking away from you. And the sun's coming up. And the only thing you know is there's a little blood in the snow steps as he's carrying off some brilliant you, you, uh, stories there. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, when you see in Frankenstein, there's, there is an incredible, he captured these moments where the monster has read the notes in Victor's great coat. And he's just in that little barn, in that little shed. And the realization of everything comes over him. You don't even have to know the story to know that's what happened. Right. Um, he does this so many times that that's what makes a masterpiece. I see a lot of guys draw beautiful things. I forget about them. Very few can put a story there. Uh, well, damn few. Well, I mean, also too, a great example is um, 
you know, the, uh, the, I, I shall be with you on your wedding night, the uh-huh. print that you have right over your shoulder there. You know, yep. I have, I have that same print, uh, hanging up in my uh, living room I, and you can yeah. just stare at it and just, it, it, it tells you everything that you need to know. I yeah. think it's for me, it's one that puts me in my place because I look at it. And as I said earlier, uh, that piece in particular best personifies, he didn't lose the enthusiasm. Mm-hmm. It has that finish. He didn't lose the lighting. He maintained texture. There's no rushed parts. There's no parts he slacked off on. The amount of concentration, dedication, the amount of of power behind that intellect to do that. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't, uh, like I said, it give him license to be a jerk if he wanted. If you can do that, you're allowed. <laughs> you know, you you can do that, you're allowed. I completely, I was always surprised because people like Steranko or Frazetta mm-hmm. or Wrightson were are gentlemen, very sweet people, very nice. That's because they knew who they were. They know what their level of accomplishment is. They're competing with themselves. Right. And if I met, went up to the guy and he threw coffee on me, I'd go, it's okay because you did this. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, this is a part of my life now. Yeah. And so if someone's giving you that much, they don't have to add more and, and be a prince to me. But he was. And, and it's a generosity of spirit. That spirit is also the thing that made him care so much. He cared for himself. There's not a competition thing in him. There mm-hmm. might have been when he was younger. I don't I don't know. But when you see work at this level, it's because he's in that undiscovered country in his head. That's where he wants to be. When you're drawing or writing, making anything creative, you're the only one there while it's happening. And for that short period of time, it's just you and this and that sheer joy cuz you are there. It's it, for people who don't do this. It's maybe watching a movie. That's the closest I can approximate it to. But mm-hmm. when you're doing work at this level, or at any level, and you're enjoying it, the pleasure of it, uh, uh, creativity is a basic thing. Everybody has it. Some people cook. It. Some people do garden. Whatever it is, there. It's just an inherent nature in people to and so when you have something like this that uh, that people like we're talking about it here years and years after he created it years after he's passed that's a lot to put on a creator uh everyone's going to measure you by your greatest work right that's just the way it goes um there's no way he could he could maintain doing this you'd think he did he yeah. he was absolutely amazing to me till the day he died and it was when he sent me this stuff for frankenstein alive alive Mm -hmm. um it was all there this incredible composition the absolute perfect angle the absolute perfect composition telling the story perfectly um he hadn't lost a step and it was, and I know how hard this is. I mean, when you're young, you have all the energy in the world. Here's this guy in his 60s battling all this other stuff, and it's there. Um, it's awesome. And I mean that in the not like trivial sense. It's awesome to be around that. I looked at this stuff. I know nuts and bolts, but I'm an emotional person. So when I look at something, I react emotionally. I don't mm-hmm. think, how did he do it? Um, the only way you can get that out of someone is you create emotionally. Mm-hmm. And he did. And so that, like a great magician, he's pouring his own essence out into the spell or into the whatever. Who knows if that, what that did help or hurt him? I don't know. But I know that that is very taxing, very exhausting. Uh, add to it people looking at whatever you say, hey, do Frankenstein every time or do Swamp Thing every time or do Freak Show every time. You can't, mm-hmm. that, you know, but that he could meant it came from some well inside of him that frankly, a lot of creative people don't have. They have a, a God-given gift, but Wrightson has something like Frazetta or like a Stranko. It just comes from some other place. 
and it just it doesn't go away and it doesn't go away in them and it doesn't go away in their finished work um i'm still as knocked out by his christopher enterprise posters mm -hmm. yeah um i wish i his portfolio work his comics um i know in france they they printed his swamp things in black and white well i want them in color too because he colored most of them as well but man to see them in black and white it's like seeing them brand new wow yeah yeah now how, how did uh how, how did you first meet uh bernie oddly enough i i met him where he didn't know i met him <laughs> uh and I was working for Marvel it was, uh, a year or two before I went to D.C. And though doing well, I wasn't doing anything I was particularly thinking. I, I was very self-critical and not in, in, in the place I wanted to be. So he was at a show, uh, San Diego, when they were uh, before they were in the big giant building. They were just in uh, forget now the name of the place, some hotel. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. And. Uh, I took off my badge and I went up and stood in line, told him all the things you have to tell someone that means that much to you. Uh, I remember he had a thing there and I bought several of his, uh, uh, the coloring book he had and a couple other things he had, he had there and I bought them, he signed them, told him how great he was. He had a picture taken with him, walked away, never said it was me. Never said I did anything because I wasn't his peer. I don't care if I was doing Marvel comics. Mm -hmm. uh, this was 12 year old Kelly talking to him, you know, well, that's uh, I talked about him so much that my parents thought he was a friend, somebody I he had, well, have him come over for dinner. My kids thought he was like an uncle that <laughs> they hadn't met yet. I would speak about him so much. It was, and our paths did not cross until much later in the uh, early 2010s. And that was when Steve Niles, who I had been working with, who had been working with Bernie, had said, Bernie would like to meet you. And he's just saying, he's wondered how come he's never met you? And I said, absolutely, I would love to. So we uh, went to the show, it was electric, uh, I had no fear of meeting him. I couldn't wait to meet him. Uh, he saw me. I saw him. Niles was just about to, that's him, pointing at me saying, that's, there, here he comes here. He didn't have to. We both came at each other and just gave a huge hug. <laughs> that's awesome. And he said, I've wanted to meet you for a long time. Uh, he's seeing the stuff I should wow. be saying. Wow. Wow. Uh, Man, that's high praise. That's, it, that's great. He says, I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. Uh, I, he, he's taken it all out of my mouth. Niles said, I'll let you guys be. And <laughs> stepped over to where he was. We sat next to each other to show and we just talked and talked and talked and talked. And um, I was stunned that he knew my work as well as he did. He told me to be quiet at one moment and just let him talk <laughs> because he knew I would try to say, Oh no. And da, da, da. he didn't, he wanted to talk and he said some pretty amazing things. And he talked about ideas. He talked about uh, stuff I had done on dead man stuff, certainly with Batman swamp thing, all these things. Um, and it was, it was a pretty amazing weekend um we had dinner we sat up all night talking and uh and it was just it was that thing he was talking to me in that way like i was there with him like, like i was of that i'd made some comment to him that i don't compete with the time i'm in i said bernie i i tend to think of the time that I love the most. The time that influenced me is where I compete. Mm -hmm. And I said, I don't think I'd cut it in your day. And he started to give me this, shut up. 
You know, absolutely you could. And you would have been in there. I've had a few of the others of that time kind of say that, but that's the real thing. And I said, look, I, I just, he says, no, you're seeing it the way you see it. You're seeing it because you, you, you were outside of it. You're inside of it. And then he began to speak in this way that was like uh, a language, his own, like you're, we're of this thing. We're fellow travelers. And I'm going to tell you this, not we're set, special or better. He really liked something he had heard me say. And I've said it a lot. I was telling some somebody I was signing a book for that in all honesty, I don't see myself as professional, but as a fan who happened to get lucky. And now I have a front row seat and I can talk to everybody and see everyone. Cause I don't have to, I can get in because they think for whatever reason, I'm one of them and I'm not, I'm, I still have all my old comics. I still have my old poster. I have not lost anything from those days. Uh, go to anyone and ask them, do you still have stuff that when you were 11, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14? No, they don't. I have everything. It's on my <laughs> wall still, <laughs> you know? I still, it still influences me to this day. So at that point, um, it's never, I'll never catch up to that. And he turns around and he just says this wonderful thing. And he just says, you know, I had the same thing happen to me. And I'm going to tell you right now, okay, you stand on my shoulders. Nothing wrong with that. I'm standing on Frazetta's. And he tells me the story where it's almost identical to our conversation when he was talking to Frazetta. And at that point, I said, okay, we're not talking anymore because that's Frank. <laughs> and that's you. And he turns right around and he said, I said the same thing for, to Frank. That's wow. you. That's not me. And that was it. And he just was very tickled that he got to say this. <laughs> because whereas he said he admired many artists and I do too, he said, "What well, we're in this school. We're in this school. And uh, he says, I've been listening to you and you understand a lot of stuff. You've been saying a lot of stuff that I, I don't really hear. And it's his own thoughts on this stuff. Um, maybe it's the genre. Maybe it's we like the same things. Uh, and I'm not even talking horror. We were talking about, I was saying at the time, uh, how much I was into the Julia Child and Jacques Pepin cooking show on channels, uh, PBS. Mm -hmm. I just kept watching it. I said, I'm drawing these incredibly monstrous things, watching people make a cheese souffle, and I'm fascinated. <laughs> and he comes right out, and he says, I'm watching that too. Oh, wow. He says, I, and he turns to his wife and tells her that, and he says, I'm obsessing on this same program. <laughs> and uh, I said, I know. I, and then we started talking about how great a chef Jacques Pepin is, you know? So, um, so there's those weird synchronicities. Uh, I think he was very taken, probably not, you know, if for nothing else, I showed him a film that scared him, you know. Uh, he told me how much he enjoyed Dead Man for the ideas, and then he would start telling me how he, his ideas, how they would come to the fore. Because I was saying, the thing about the werewolf, I told him, I said, I've always stood in awe, um, but that he changed culturally how, you know, and in our world, that's a big deal, you know? Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and I said, I, no one had done, I, nothing, no one had done that. Um, Frankenstein, he literally took me away from thinking of Karloff now, I think of his. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. That's a big one, because Karloff and, you know, he and I went off on, uh, Karloff is Frankenstein. You know, yeah. and how much we can watch those movies anytime they're on. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what's going on. Um, so, so at that point, there was a lot of connections on these things. Uh, and, and at that point, you realize that this is a guy who, though he had all these skills, was still this incredibly talented, immensely generous 12 year old kid. <laughs> you know, he, it was all there. Um, when he passed, it was the absolute end of an era. Um, uh, it's like I always, see, I you know, uh, it, 
that there will be no more rights and artwork is a very bizarre thing to me. Um, So it's important. I mean, all we have left are these little insights or stories or whatever. Right. He gave us enough, though. He I mean, gave us uh, enough. I, I, I always feel like he had felt he hadn't done enough. And I had always said, Jesus, you know, you did. His All passing the- was four years and two days, two days ago, yeah. I believe. So we just missed the anniversary with this. I didn't realize that until this morning. Yeah. Uh-huh. It seems and- to me with Alive Alive, I feel like, and tell me if, if you think I'm off mark here, but in rereading it, I feel like, and I'm just thinking this now listening to you talk about him and his relationship with his work and how, you know, you, you said the sadness with having to share it yeah. with the Frankensteins. I feel like he wrote the sequel to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein that he wanted to read. Right. He didn't do it for anything else. I mean, I know Steve Niles, you know, no, it, Steve, they... uh, very interestingly, Steve had told me, he says, I never wrote anything. Bernie said what he wanted to do. And I helped just put this down so it would give him a structure. Uh, and that's all I did. I, he says, all of it's him. Uh, and when I've got the stuff to do the final issue, all of the notes are there. Everything they're saying, everything they're doing. Steve, like me, was just happy to be there and that right. front row seat. Right. Where you get to watch this because I knew that I was seeing Michelangelo paint some figures on right. the ceiling, yeah. and and uh, uh, it puts you in your place. Let me tell you, you look at it. His thumbnails perfect. His his extrapolating upon the thumbnails perfect. His focusing. There is so little difference between his little thumbnail, which literally is a postage stamp to the next size. They're perfect. Wow. What was in his head, he was just making sure where everything went. There is no fixing, changing, tweaking. Uh, it's literally what was here. He had the rare ability. Frank Frazetta, I keep saying his name, but he had to have been the same. That went here, went to here on the paper. There was no, I lost something. I didn't see something. I didn't get right. it right. Um if Wrightson ever said that, it's probably because in his head he got tired of it. <laughs> That's it. But it's not because it wasn't there. And maybe what was here, he didn't, you know, once he saw it. But it wasn't that the the drawing wasn't right. When I got these Frankensteins, I just, I froze. And I hadn't froze since 20, 30 years earlier, you know. Um, and so when... When I saw this, I froze and, and I and I blew a deadline. And I told him, look, I'm sorry. I this is unbelievable. And also I was at the same time, it was back to back. Uh Len Wein had passed away a few months after. Mm-hmm. So I got to know both of these guys extremely well. And DC had asked me to finish his last script. And uh I was partially into drawing it anyway i shelved it i figured you know we were going to do swamp thing a second sequel to it so at the same time i received this was the same time i received lens final oh wow was told to finish lens final script so with both of them though they had to be done it was this morning process the whole time every day i was dealing with this again and it's not just you know them personally, but it's also you're letting go something of your childhood. You're letting something go of your right. youth. And I knew it was in both cases be the last thing these guys did. It would be it. There would be no more Len, no more Bernie. Uh, it was it was a fairly bizarre year because yeah. – uh, both of them had meant so much. I was glad that I was able to uh, talk to Len so much about Swamp Thing, uh, and that because it was just a lot of anecdotal stuff. A lot of, I mean, he re, he had a steel trap mind and remembered everything um, on that creation. Other stuff he didn't remember, but that wasn't with Ryson. When it came to this, he remembered everything. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, so stuff that it would be a little, you know. 
I would want to ask Bernie, but then, you know, I, I would go, well, maybe that's too in the weeds, too fanboyish or whatever. Uh, with Len, I had no problem. Len loved talking about it. Len loved hearing the praise. So I had a good time talking with him about how did you do this or how this, you know, one in particular, uh, a sequence. Uh, he always used to love and writes and did too. I told them, they both asked me, how did I become, when did I become a fan or whatever? And I had said that when I was a kid living in those woods where before Bigfoot and whatever, <laughs> um, a friend of my father didn't want his kid to read comics anymore. So he had a big, like a chest full of comics and he just gave them to my dad. My dad didn't care if I read comics, watched horror or anything. Um, so I read them and they were all mainstream books, Fantastic Fours, Avengers, mm -hmm. all good stuff, all great. I was reading them. In there was Bernie's Swamp Thing number two, Lennon Bernie's Swamp Thing number two. And as much as I love horror, I didn't believe horror and comics should be together for whatever reason. You know, when, as a kid, I just, it, it, they do things, they fly, they help people, they're good. But when I saw this, <laughs> and I didn't like it, and I didn't like it, and I didn't like it, I finished it, I put it back, and I couldn't believe how, and I stuck it back in the books. But it stayed with me, and in for that next two hours, like the like some incredible taboo, I didn't go back and read the Avengers or the Captain Americas, or whatever. I went back and read that again. Wow. And in that moment, and the emotion of it, and I would tell both these guys, I told them that story. I said, and afterwards, I said, when I was done the second time, and I loved this story, I loved it. Uh, Wrightson's Unmen to this day are incredible. They're still disturbing. Uh, I, I, I would put forward probably one of the most disturbing things ever in a comic book is that guy with the, his hand and his head on it and he's crawling up his leg. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's so many great moments in this thing and I went back to see who did it and they had these perfect names Ween and Wrightson like yeah. those are the only names that could create this <laughs> so I told them both this story Len particularly loved I hated it and then came back and loved it and I must have told him this story every time almost we would talk. He'd say, okay, tell me the story again when you read the first thing by, uh, that I had ever done. And uh, Wrights and I got to tell that a couple of times too, because he found that really funny that he says, I'm a real coward when it comes to horror too. You know, I told him, I said, when I watch horror films, it's like this generally, uh, you know, and hands over my face or whatever. And he was the same way. He said these, yes. He says, I said, I, I have to go back and look Texas Chainsaw Massacre. I had to do alien was a, that, that was, you know, I was, I could feel internal organs shutting down while I was watching <laughs> it. So, um, but I said, that's, and people always are surprised because they go, well, you do horror. I go, because I'm horrified. I'm, I'm that's why you do it. Well, sensitive. I'm just sensitive to it. Mm -hmm. So I'll focus on it. Maybe I'm trying to work. I'll let Freud figure it out. <laughs> um, but he was that same way. So these guys liked hearing that um, because they knew they were doing something. They knew Swamp Thing was different. You know, when I would say to Bernie, you know, they created a whole new genre, a whole new style. Uh, they do this and all of a sudden you get all these Marvel horror books, right? Mm -hmm. um, it opened the doors for so many people. And he gives me this all shucks thing. Like, well, they would have done it anyway. Oh, it was going that route. Oh, you know, I'm going, no. I said, you opened the door for so many of us uh, back in the day uh, from just these little doing short, because he would say, well, there was the anthology series. I said, it wasn't like, that was different every time. We weren't following someone. Right. We weren't following, a, uh, we weren't following a character and we certainly weren't following a creator because you'd go to Marvel and you'd follow uh, Plug on Frankenstein, um, Tom Sutton, uh, Gene Colan doing Dracula. I mean, there's a lot of guys, all of a sudden there's a whole new genre and it all right. started with Bernie and uh, his 
absolute insistence that he was going to do horror. Not like a jerk, not like I'm. this is the only way I'll do it. He, that's just what he was going to do. And they went, okay, uh, that's then let's figure it out. And and they did, and he opened the door for a lot of us. He just all shucks to me all the time. Len loved it. He goes, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, that's what happened. Uh, and he says, you know, I had to convince Bernie to do it, and I loved that. It was this two, <laughs> they were great. Um, and it it's sobering because Len had told me, he says, you know, when, when they had approved doing another Swamp Thing, it was under the thing that under the premise that if we say if if we do it, they wanted to go on to a regular series with Swamp Thing again. Mm -hmm. And so he was saying, can you do that? And I said, I think I can. Uh, and he had these great ideas. Well, it was six issues, then six issues. He says, but I'm going to go in there and tell him we're not starting with the number one again. We're going to start with number 13 because that'll be the 13th issue. And that'll be our first issue. Uh, he had all these great, great ideas for it. And, um, but he told me once, and it was very arresting. He says, you know, I only have written, he says, I wrote 13 originally, I believe, and six with you. So that's 18. And now this, whatever. And he says, uh, Wrightson, I've done 10. And with you now I've done, I'm had never thought of that. Cause I, you know, we edited it. He worked with more and all these people on it, but he didn't see it that way. Um, divergently, Wrightson was going, well, no, it should go the, the more Alan Moore point of view that he said, uh, Bernie would always say, say, well, you know, they really improved on whatever. Len took that. No, we, that, that's great. What they did is great. That's their version. I still have Alec Holland as a monster. He's in a monster body. He's resisting. That's it. There's a lot to do with that. So he asked me, well, how do you feel about this? Before he told me that story, how do you feel about Swamp Thing? And I just blurted out. I said, I respect and loved all the other stuff. But to me, it's still Alec Holland in there trying to figure out how do I handle things and not break them? And how do I talk? And, you know, that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. Yeah. I said, I, I, I said, maybe that's a little kid in me, but I, I'll never get tired of that. And uh, he, that's when he came out and told me this. And he says, okay, then we're on the same page. And, and I said, okay. Um, that, that uh, you know, I always wonder how my career would have been because they were both to do Swamp Thing in 1985. Mm -hmm. And Bernie did about 20, 25 pages of it. And they approved it all. Everything was going great. And then Bernie just said, I can't do this anymore. I can't draw this character anymore. He didn't feel connected to it anymore. Um, he felt what what uh, others were doing was superior to his vision in his head, so he couldn't really connect. Uh, drove Len nuts, but Len knew Bernie real well, and he said, okay, fine. How it affected my career was at that time before they decided to shuttle it, Len wanted me to do it. Oh. Now, I didn't even, I wasn't even on the radar. I was doing the Micronauts, I think. I don't even, I never even it's gave like 83, an 83, 84? Uh, something like that. It's around 85 that this happened. Okay. Well, Len then says to me, while we're doing this, I wanted you to do this. I went to DC and they said, look, no offense to Kelly, no offense to anyone. If Bernie's not doing it, we're not doing it. And he fought and fought and fought for it. And I tell Len, I said, that's BS. You're just saying that to make me happy to be here now because I fanboy you all the time. And you're, and he said, he got bugged at me. So in the mail, and he kept saying, no, really, you don't believe me. I said, oh, Len, you're, thank you for that. But no, I don't. <laughs> you, know, I, you didn't know me. I said, I had only been working about three years in comics. Uh, you would have to be a science fiction guy. I was still learning how to do this. Uh, there was nothing I did, I think, of great distinction then. Uh, no, I, I appreciate it, but no. <laughs> and he said it bugged him. A couple weeks later, I get in the mail this uh, thing on Swamp Thing uh, interviewing him from, I don't know, maybe 15 years earlier, 20 years earlier, 15 years earlier. How he had a copy, I don't know. And in it, he had posted it 
where he had mentioned this, that Bernie had quit, he wanted me to do it and that mm. they had said this. And he sent it to me. And all it said is C with a question with a question mark. <laughs> and uh, so at that point I went, okay. And, he, and that wasn't to make me feel good. It was to say what great taste he had, that he could see the future and all that. It, <laughs> I always love that with Len. No, no, no. That I could see, I could see. Like, okay. Okay. That's, that's funny. Um, so no, I was, it was, like I said, a rough year. They both passed within a few months. I remember when, Bernie died and uh, Lynn and I spoke a few days after that because he was having some health issues then and they didn't tell him because he was in the hospital. So uh, we were talking and he, you know, I had told him that I had been asked to finish this thing and I was really having trouble with that. And he says, no, you have to. Uh, and then he had said, you know, I, I had a lot of health troubles when I was young so every day has been gravy for me since I was a teenager. Every day is an extra day. I shouldn't be here. So every day was a very good day in comics. I got to do what I wanted. I'm creating. Uh, it doesn't mean everything you do is perfect. It doesn't mean that at all. It just means it was a good day. I'm here still. He says, when they told me Bernie died is the only bad day I've had in comics. He says, that was a bad day. And I went, yeah, it is. Yeah. And I said, and I don't even have that. You know, I said, I don't even have that connection you do. And he says, yes, you do, because you were that 12-year-old kid who, or 10-year-old or whatever, who he scared the shit out of you. And you were connected to him from that point on. And he said, so yeah, I can, you know, I have the stories and the actual interaction. He says, but you had something very pure because you just knew him for his talent for all those years, all those formative years. <laughs> and... That I could understand because people will come up to you and they'll tell you something that you've done, really how important it is. And you have to kind of be reminded of it, you know, because um, you're onto the next thing and mm -hmm. you don't know any of these things are going to be like that. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernie was drawing monsters because as he was a boy, he loved monsters. He loved horror. He loved these things. Um he, he tried to bring a sophistication to them, which he did. He tried to bring yeah. a level of artistry that frankly is better than anything I've seen by any superhero guy ever. It, his level of genius to this genre. Uh, he quit being a comic book artist or even a superior elite comic book artist to a great American illustrator. And kind of, oh yeah, he did that too. Mm -hmm. um, I don't say that because I know him as a fan or anything. I just, it's hard for me to think of someone else. Yeah, no, there isn't there. there yeah. I, I, I just, don't think it's there hard is. for me to think of someone else I, in, in so that I believe 400 years from now, his stuff will still, it will be that ringing moment at that time. He will be an important guy. <laughs> his work will be uh, as collected as any of the artists with you collect 400 years ago. Um, I mean, it, 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 it really feels like that's how it is right now. It does. It I mean, does. it's it does. like just the, 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 the Bernie Wrightson fan community is getting larger and larger. But we every don't have to convince, day. we don't have to convince anyone that he's a genius. Mm -hmm. Right. We don't have to do it like everybody else where you'd have to kind of explain it because they're wearing tights and a cape and whatever. Mm -hmm. 400 years from now, you're going to have to kind of explain that to people what that meant rights. And you don't have to, there's a low level demon sitting on a crag with a girl whispering in his ear about some, you know, mm -hmm. uh, girl crouching at his feet. And that piece would work if it was done 500 years from now, uh, counsel to a minion is a genius piece. Mm -hmm. And that works. Then it work. It works now. Um, so there's no explanation. He will traverse time. His Frankenstein illustrations, certainly. But just his work, just these drawings of his, these uh, from his sketches to his fully realized color work, his Edgar Allan Poe mm -hmm. portfolio. The sad yeah, part gorgeous. is, the sad part, guys, is that a lot of this stuff can't be reprinted pro properly because you'd have to have the originals. Then mm -hmm. they have to be scanned because everything now went from 
uh, metal pre metal printing to laser scanning. So they have to be redone. You can't go from a photograph. They have to do it through a, sc a computer scan. So you won't get re quality reprints of a look back ever. Uh, wow. You won't get quality reprints of these things or repressings. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it will be like a museum book. They'll they'll be yeah. somewhere. They'll have permission to scan it. They'll have permission to present it. That's you know. Um, so a lot of these things, uh, they don't lose their power, but they're not going to be as accessible. Like right. a look back was my textbook. I had uh, the great fight we all do, uh, trying to say that these guys that we love are legitimate artists. When you're with an art teacher who says they're not, they're <laughs> illustrators. They're this low level thing. They're at the bottom of the fish tank. Yeah, at the top are the great artists. And I had that argument and that fight with my college art professor who I never learned anything in those places. I learned it. My textbook was a look back. Mm -hmm. And I remember being criticized heavily for the kind of artwork I was producing uh, for that reason. And kind of went round and round. It was affecting the grades and that's fine. Um, because I wasn't relenting on that. And so finally I just said, let me bring into you, you've told me all this stuff. And I told, I told her, you've told me all this stuff. Let me bring into you what's influencing me. So I brought a look back in. I brought, a, at that time, the book, uh, Right Since Frankenstein hadn't come out, but the portfolios had. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there's three or four of these beautiful portfolios. I brought the Edgar Allan Poe. I brought Jennifer and uh, a couple of his EC Warren things and, and some Swamp things. And I brought them in for her to look at. It meant nothing to her, bounced off of her, right? Just bounced off, but we got heated and we're going back and forth because it quit being even that I thought this is a legitimate art form. She's putting, you can't see this, you know? Yeah. And I think I said something as awful as, well, how can I trust you if you can't see this? How can right. I trust anything you're teaching me if you can't see this? Yeah. Um, well, it's a bias at that point, right? It's it, like she's it not is, even open a, to it. No, and it. I'm big on res respecting the people that, but I, as I was a kid then, I was like 18. I was about a year or so before I got actually hired, or even closer. I was around the time uh, by Marvel. So anyway, we're going back and forth. Well, while this is going on, it's the class has kind of stopped now and they're watching this, <laughs> you know, cause we're going back and forth and I'm unaware of the class. I figure they're all doing their own, mm -hmm. you know, it's a figure study class of a fine art figure study. And I'm taking it as a requirement and I hate art classes. I'd rather be taking astronomy or history than art classes. Cause they always derail me. Mm -hmm. All they, t all they ever did to me. And then I told her this, all you do is tell me what can't be done and the rules and the structure rather than leave me alone and I'll figure it out. I, I don't need a boundary. Um, so the, all the materials I brought in, other people are starting to go through. They wanna see who we're talking about. Right. <laughs> so this one guy's going through and I can hear him as, as, as this is going on, it starts to put more spine in me as it was, even though I was arguing, cause I hear him ooing and aahing at a look back. Ooh, wow. Ah, he's doing that. Uh, the portfolio, the Edgar Allan Poe portfolio, they're just, I can hear people complimenting it. This is great. This guy draws comics, that kind of thing. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> they all had the view of comics, rightfully so. Uh, they're going through the Frankenstein thing. Like, this is, this is how, when did he, is this guy still alive? Because this looks so classically right mm -hmm. yeah yeah and um this is going on and one girl did it all said it the best she was going through um a couple of the creepy and eerie side brought in and she had read jennifer and she she slid this well i hate this i hate this because she'd read jennifer and i looked at her and she goes this is going to give me nightmares <laughs> this bothers me. This is just disturbing. And I went, that's the reaction I want. Yep. Yeah. Right? Now I got to tell both these guys this story, Wrightson in particular. <laughs> and I said, the beauty, the kicker of the story was, I think this was in a September. I was hired uh, coincidentally uh, on Halloween day 
to go to Marvel that same year. So I was able to go in and resign the class. Oh. And <laughs> yeah, I just figured, screw this, right? So I was able to go in and resign the class. And I told her then that my professor was Wrightson. And he's the guy. I said, I'm going to be one of the only people you ever meet that will make a living creating art. Not as a hobby, not as just something easy pass class. And I won't be a teacher. I'll actually be making art. And it's due to this guy. <laughs> it's due to this guy. <laughs> That's awesome. And, wow. uh, you know, I had the good fortune, and I don't mean this as a rub in or anything. I had the good fortune of uh, several years later when I was doing Dead Man, finally got to get to Dead Man, that I said, okay, I better take another just to loosen up a, a, a drawing class like this. And this woman at a different venue was teaching there. And uh, it was such a pleasure to let her know that I was, what I was doing <laughs> and that I came in there and she was still dismissive, but I was the only person that the figure model would come over and say, can I have that when, if, if that's okay, can I have that? Oh, wow. Can and she <laughs> wonderfully had said very, so everyone could hear, she'd been doing it for five or six years. This is the only time she was asking for anything. Oh, wow. And I went, yes, absolutely take it. Because, you know, may, and I got to resign that class too, because I had the, <laughs> just too much was happening that I had to leave. And, uh, but, but those guys, you know, Wrights in particular loved hearing that. Um, uh, and he says, yeah, you run into that. And yes, you meet that. Uh, he says, I haven't heard something that pointed. And I said, I think it happens a lot. And especially probably now more so uh, because it's a, it's more into the pop culture. Uh, you're getting to know at the end of these movies, they actually give the, some names of these. I've worked, I've done stuff designing for films where they didn't do that. Mm -hmm. And now they do do that. Um, Cause I'd done, uh, three or four Batman movies and stuff like that, where you give them a bunch of stuff and they, you know, that's fine. I actually rather have my credit on the first page of the book or whatever. Right. Um, that's where I belong. I'm, I'm not, you know, that that's, that's to me the important thing. I'm much more about the comic. Um, I'm much more about that, that being the focus. Uh, I'm not into illustrative comics. I'm into comics, comics. Um, I'm into imagination, not realism. And all those things come from Bernie. You know, uh, Bernie lived in his imagination and felt that was the only place you were going to get what he did was from him. That was a great instructive lesson. You're the only guy who's going to do it. So put that on paper. Uh, and, uh, probably he felt he connected to me because uh, he called me an idea guy too. He saw himself as an idea person. And he was, I mean, there's many great artists, but you forget them until you look at them, you forget them. Wrightson always kicks around, you know, he just kicks around and you go, that looks like a, or it feels like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know, uh, like I said, if, whether I drew or not, whether my personal affection for him, that's not what I'm saying. There's no bias in this. It's just, right. I, it's hard for me to think of other people like that. And I don't mean that as they're not as good. It's, that's not what I no. mean. It's just, it just means that's why he was so unique. Um, I would put Kirby is like that. Kirby stays in your head. Mm -hmm. And there's no way they'd hire a Kirby now. They would even understand a Kirby. He's more abstract right. now than at the time. And I'm always remembered by uh, Jim Stranko's great, great comment on Kirby many years ago now, easily 30 or 40 years ago, 40 years ago. And he had said, somebody was saying how odd Kirby was. And it was, I remember this. And he said, hey, 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 you're absolutely right. And he's Jack's work is 10 years ahead of where we are right now. And in 10 years from now, it will be 10 years ahead of where it is now okay. then. And it just will never, will now catch up because you're looking at a tour de force coming out of here. And that's where I put rights in. There's no, there's a timeless to this. And 
as time goes on, this stuff gets more powerful. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was knocked out as a kid. I was knocked out as a professional, whatever I am, always knocked out, but I got more knocked out as time went on. When I had to do Swamp Thing, I, I reread them because Len says, I want you to reread them. We're going to discuss it and da 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 da. And he kept saying, You're not getting back to me. You're not getting back. I said, uh, the, the, I'm freezing up. These are brilliant, even more so than I thought. And I'm spending all day, I'm losing time because I reread them and I'm a kid again, get the bologna sandwich and I get the big glass of chocolate milk and I'm sitting <laughs> and I was doing that. And I was going, these are so good. These are so, look, the power of these things. Uh, I once lost, oh, okay. The book that I was telling you about, that issue two that I hated, mm -hmm. I, I still have that book. That's one of those physical markers of a change in your life, of a thing that inspires you. It's physically there. It isn't just the love of a genre. It isn't the it's that, that I wanted to draw. He legitimized my, the same things going in my head. I wanted to do this. And I agreed with his decisions. It's very hard to find that. So that book has become more precious to me than it's simply Swamp Thing number two and it's physical value and it's whatever. It's a, an actual marker. Right. I lost my wedding ring once and it didn't matter to me at all because I can go down and get another wedding ring. But if I lost this thing, inconsolable. I would have been, in, and my wife always goes, you know, if I tell people that, I go, I know. <laughs> She's I like, no. You have to stop telling people that story. <laughs> but she, but she understands my love of Wrightson. Yeah. And she goes, I agree. Yes, you can go down and get another wedding ring. You can't find that. I can find another issue too, but I couldn't find that issue, mm -hmm. that physical thing. Yeah. Um. And like I said, I would talk about him in those ways that she knew this is more than just being a fan. This is in your blood. Right. Um, and it isn't just what would Bernie do? It isn't like that. It was just this, look at this, man. I would tell her, look at that. And I never really did that with artists. She knows comics and what, but I said, you just, this is beautiful. It's quiet. It's exquisite extremely well drawn the compositions are fine these are panels it, we're not even talking as big fancy stuff we're just saying these things they're each one is perfectly thought out mm -hmm. uh, it's it's you don't even have to be uh an expert in the form you don't have to be you just respond to someone's brilliance like that um you you know that they are taking you somewhere and saying, look at this. Would yeah. you look at this? Feel this. And for them to get to you, to convey to you the same emotion or the feeling or the reaction that they had while creating it from their head to the paper, very few people. Very few. I, I short list. I very few. There's people you can be impressed with, people that knock you out, people that stay with you. They can have moments of doing it. And I hope sometimes I always go, man, I hope I get that moment. I hope I get a sequence. Okay. So that's the first part of our two-part discussion with Kelly Jones. As I mentioned at the top, come back to us this Wednesday, March 24th for part two. Thanks for listening. This has been a most horrible library. Mm -hmm.